Well, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on your location. And thank you so much for joining us. I am delighted to welcome you to this Asia Undercurrent webinar. I'm Hayley Channer. I direct the Economic Security Program at the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney in Sydney, Australia. And uh, there's so much to talk about, um, including for my own US Studies Centre. There's a lot of news coming out of the United States in recent weeks, all associated with the US's democratic elections and who will lead the country during the second half of the 2020s. Now, the answer to that question actually has a lot to do with the theme of this webinar this morning, which is about the future of a free and open Indo-Pacific, how Japan and its allies are working together in the face of new challenges. Now, it's been a while, actually, since there's been an Asia undercurrent webinar uh, on the regional order itself. There have been webinars on space, people-to-people uh, -people exchange, technology and disinformation, but this time we're looking more at regional organising frameworks. Now, this is a crucial time to be reflecting on the free and open Indo-Pacific concept because, frankly, we are facing a polycrisis of challenges impacting the region, making it less free, less open and more contested. Earlier this year in Australia, Australia's Foreign Minister Penny Wong gave a speech to the Australian National University's National Security College. During that speech, she said, the existing system of rules and norms is under strain. And as we face evolving threats, the system has not evolved in turn. Now to talk about this regional order and this system, please allow me to introduce to you our expert panel for this Asia Undercurrent webinar. We have Dr. Michael Oslin from the United States, Professor Kyoko Hatakiyama from Japan, and Professor Chester Cabalza from the Philippines. Firstly, Dr. Michael Oslin. Dr. Oslin is the Payson J. Treat Distinguished Research Fellow in Contemporary Asia at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Dr. Oslin specializes in US foreign policy and geopolitics, especially in Asia. Previously, he was a professor at Yale, and he is the Senior Advisor for Asia at the Halifax International Security Forum and a Senior Fellow at Philadelphia's Foreign Policy Research Institute. Michael, fantastic to see you again. Next, we have Professor Kyoko Hatakiyama. Professor Hatakiyama is a Professor of International Relations at the Graduate School of International Studies and Regional Development, University of Niigata Prefecture. Before this position, Hatakiyama Sensei was a research analyst with Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Her areas of expertise include Asia's regional security, maritime security, Japan's foreign and security policy, and economic security. And I'm delighted to report that she re received her PhD from Macquarie University in Australia. And lastly, we have Professor Chester Cabalza. Professor Cabalza is the founder and president of the Manila-based think tank, International Development and Security Cooperation. He is also a professor in the Graduate School at the University of the Philippines. Professor Cabalza previously held the position of Vice President for the Center of Research and Strategic Studies and was formerly a consultant of the World Bank and the Japan International and Cooperation Agency. Okay, so now we've done introductions. Let's turn to the focus of the discussion, which is really about whether Japan and its partners and allies countries like the US, Philippines and Australia, and hopefully in future other countries like South Korea and India, can help strengthen and stabilise the region we live in via an organising principle, the free and open Indo-Pacific concept, or the slightly awkward acronym FOIP. Uh, since um, FOIP was first announced by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2016, it has been endorsed by multiple other world leaders and it is carried on by Prime Minister Kishida and his counterparts. But what has FOIP come to mean? There can be multiple interpretations. One is that it's about establishing a rules-based order in the region whereby countries abide by rules that respect state sovereignty, allow for freedom of navigation, and allow for the free and open flow of goods and services, whether that's access, trade, or communications. In my personal view, FOIP is about giving countries the freedom to pursue their own destiny, grow and prosper without undue interference. Now, this principle is really under threat, including from countries like China, 
but also I would argue in part it is being challenged by countries that champion the concept like the United States. The United States still promotes FOIP, but in terms of the US trade policy, industrial policy and technology decoupling from China, there are clearly limits on how free and how open the United States intends to be in the Indo-Pacific. So there are lots of questions around FOIP, both in terms of whether it's currently a useful organising principle, whether it will endure, and also what its future could look like. To discuss these questions and hopefully provide some answers, I'm going to invite our panellists to provide some opening remarks, about five to six minutes each. Then I'm going to ask some questions based off of their analysis, and I'm going to moderate some questions from you, the audience. We have an extremely large audience today. Around 1,800 people are joining us from all over the Indo-Pacific region. So there's clearly a huge interest in this concept, its future, and how countries in the region, Japan and its allies, are looking to take this concept further in future. Just on the topic of Q&A, if you're watching live on the Nikkei channel or the YouTube live, um, please scroll down and find the Q&A link to submit your questions. Please also make sure to include your affiliation and your country. Uh, and please engage with us. That's why we're here. The organisers will try and get to all of your questions, but the sooner you submit them, the better chance you have of your question being asked. Now, with that, that's enough from me. I'd love to hand over to Dr. Oslin. Um, can I ask you how you're seeing FOIP from uh, your American perspective? Well, first, uh, Dr. Channer, thank you for uh, the kind introduction and, and to everyone uh, having me back. Uh, it's been a, a few years and I'm, I'm glad to see that the series is is still going on because I think the, the issues, as you pointed out, have only been getting uh, more critical. Uh, but obviously, I could talk, uh, and I will, about the, um, uh, you know, at least my perspective of the U.S. position uh, regarding FOIP uh, and, and U.S. policy, but I, I venture to guess that people are possibly moderately interested in what's going on in the United States over the past 48 hours or so, or or nine days, uh, depending on, on what you're focusing on. And so uh, it, it probably is um, makes a little bit of sense to try to talk about that in, in, in the larger perspective. Um, you know, we like to think in Washington, which is where I sit right now in Washington, D.C., that, you know, our, our policy towards the Indo-Pacific is um, is bipartisan in general and that that it transcends any one administration because the interests that we've had in the Indo-Pacific uh, not just for decades, but I would actually argue for uh, a century and a half, uh, and actually going close to two centuries, have been uh, have been pretty steady and clear. And and from one historical perspective, the United States' overarching policy towards the Indo-Pacific has been a free and open Indo-Pacific, stretching back to the 19th century. Uh, that goes back to the period of of the uh, open door at the uh, the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. It actually goes back into the 1840s when the United States, as a very small and weak power, wanted to make sure that it would have the ability to enter into trade relations or missionary relations or whatever whatever it wanted and and not not face uh, being locked out by larger powers. And then you can obviously take that forward into the 20th century where the policy of the United States was essentially essentially to prevent any one aggressive hegemonic power from dominating the region. And as you put it, Dr. Channer, in your introduction, uh, to pressure any smaller nations or, or in, for that matter, larger nations from not being able to follow their own preferred policies. So in many ways, the United States policy has been, been unchanged. Um, I think in terms of uh, what we face going forward, uh, there are uncertainties on on both sides. Um, with uh, President Biden's decision not to uh, seek re-election uh, and the possibility, at least, that Vice President Harris will be the nominee, uh, we don't really know what her position is on the Indo-Pacific. She's, she's not had a foreign policy background. Uh, she's made some visits, and, and, and in those visits, they haven't been entirely uh, successful, some would say, certain gaffes during those visits to Asia, but it's certainly something that is new to her. 
Um, and conversely, of course, former President Trump, who uh, will be the is the Republican nominee, uh, had a, uh, uh, a I think what many people would say was a mixed record, a record in which allies were initially at least uncertain about what the United States' policies would be. Uh, but then uh, the his his administration came to a position, at least I would call it probably of of um, uh, an overriding policy of reciprocity towards China, meaning that that I think what they were looking for uh, was a a modus vivendi with China, where there would be reciprocal actions, and that would that would determine uh, the pace of the relationship. But they certainly changed what had been a forty year relationship or forty year uh, pattern of the relationship towards one that was more. Um, uh, made more demands on China, let's put it that way. Some would call it confrontational, some would call it realistic. And so the question, of course, is that if he is elected and comes back, what does that mean? Would uh, a second President Trump administration or a potential President Harris or, or another Democrat, because we don't know how that process will play out, uh, would they be as committed to Asia? Um, and there's a couple of different ways to, to cut at that uh, at that question. Uh, one, of course, is um, just how messy this process will get. It's already been very messy. Will it get messier? Uh, and therefore, will, will Asia be a priority for them? Uh, I mean, in some ways, it will force itself as a priority because of what China and North Korea will do, because of what our allies want to do. But how much attention will they focus on it? Who will be the key personnel that they have in those positions? Right now, all of that uh, remains unknown. And so, the question of the United States supporting a, a continuation of FOIP or, or working to strengthen it and to make it a an undergirding uh, an undergirding of of relations uh, remains uh, remains unknown. Secondly, of course, would just be personal preferences. Uh, is this something that they would put at the top of their list, or will it be, as is in the case of uh, let's say a President Trump, a focus on domestic issues, a focus on, uh, from his view, rejuvenating uh, U.S. competitiveness, and that, as as you pointed out, could potentially uh, work against a a freer and and more open Indo-Pacific. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways uh, that this uh, you know that this can be approached, um, and and you know it's. It's not helpful, but I think it's true to say that we we simply have a great deal of uncertainty. Um, underneath that, though, remains, of course, our alliance system, the new initiatives of the um, sorry, the new initiatives of the uh, Obama of of the Biden administration, such as AUKUS uh, and the trilateral U.S. Korea Japan relationship and, and agreement. And so we have the structures in place. Um, and the structures are critical and the structures are important, but they do have to be um, infused with a spirit by uh, the president on down and an administration that doesn't just consider them as, as a background or doesn't just consider them as automatically taking care of themselves, but rather is something they will, they will fully commit to. And so um, I think FOIP, is a long-standing policy of the U.S. I think it goes back into the 19th century. It clearly is is a guiding uh, a guiding idea. I think behind our alliances and behind the innovations uh, of the Biden administration uh, in the alliances, and quite frankly, uh, I, I would argue what the Trump administration was trying to do to ensure uh, the continued openness of the region, uh, but. It may take this new president a while to find their footing. Uh, it's going to be a, a very, I believe it will be rocky, I hope not too rocky process going forward uh, through November and then settling into the into the next year. And so then I think it, and I'll close here by saying then it redounds in many ways to our allies, to our partners, and, and I would uh, in there quite honestly put Japan at, at the very head um, to be maintaining that process because of its own inherent goodness and and that that will then i hope bring the united states uh fully into the process and full commitment which i think is where the us would like to be but as with every country it's what's happening at home that really determines how much effort energy and attention they can put towards it so i'll stop there thank you michael thank you so much for that 
I think everyone knew 2024 being a major election year globally with so many different countries having democratic elections that the focus of country leaders is understandably going to be domestic politics because you've got to win the election. And I think it just so happens that the US election seems to be more fascinating to so many people, more so than India's election or UK's election, for instance, uh, because I guess of some of the things that we see, whether it's attempted assassinations or, or people bowing out sort of late in the race. But like you said, there are so many enduring interests that the United States has in a free and open, stable and secure Indo-Pacific region that we hope any future administration would carry that forward. But obviously, this framework is under threat. And hopefully we can get more into the, the Q&A when we talk about how the US is actually seeing itself in the region. But before we do that, could I please hand over to Hatakiyama Sensei, uh, Kyoko, if you don't mind, or would you like to give us a, your introductory comments on the free and open Indo-Pacific? So thank you very much for having me. Um, the Indo-Pacific region has attracted worldwide attention, as you know, since the 2010s. The background is China's increasing assertive behavior in the maritime domain, claiming its jurisdiction in the South China Sea encircled by the Nine Dash Line. China has taken assertive attitudes by, for instance, blocking resource exploitation and fishing by the littoral states. As a result, the tensions between the littoral states and China are rising. In the East China Sea, China has claimed its sovereign right over the Senkak Islands administered by Japan. Although China justifies its action, its attempts to change the status quo by using gray zone strategy elevated tensions in the region. So they're facing the challenges posed by China, the late Prime Minister Abe announced the FOIP in 2016, demonstrating Japan's readiness to pursue economic prosperity of the region and maintain the rule of law. That was an epoch-making concept in that Japan, which does not possess military power, demonstrated its determination to contribute to regional peace and stability. FOIP was also remarkable because Japan presented an alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative so that the regional states do not have to depend on China for their economic growth. Since the regional states do not wish to take sides in competition between the United States and China, they welcome Japan's FOIP, which is inclusive. Although FOIP is a response to China's BRI, it is not an anti-China strategy. Kishida's FOIP is more comprehensive, expanding the areas of cooperation to attract the global South states, but the basic principle is the same. Abe also revived the quote, a loose grouping consisting of India, the United States, Australia, and Japan, driving minilateralism. Although the quote does not focus on security issues, but rather on strengthening public goods, it sent a message to China that the group keeps an eye on the maritime situation in the region. The security cooperation between the United States, Australia, Japan, the Philippines also started. Moreover, Japan has strengthened its security relationships with Australia and the Philippines by concluding the reciprocal access agreement with both states. Trilateral security dialogue between Australia, Japan, the United States was also reinforced by having frequent meetings. Similarly, Australia launched AUKUS with the United States and the UK for new, to develop nuclear submarines. Thus, due to China's attempts to change the status quo, like-minded states, including Japan, deepened their defense relationships with each other and create a security network with the United States at the center. Such a security network contributes to the realization of the FOIP concept, which emphasizes the rule of law. Kishida's FOIP expanded its scope of cooperation, including infrastructure development, climate change, capacity building support, fair economic order, clean energy, and connectivity, etc. Its focus extended to various areas to get support from like-minded states and other states, namely the global subs. As I said, 
Japan announced FOIP in the wake of China's assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. Although the security situation has become more volatile since then due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the deepening security relationship between China and Russia, FOIP, which emphasizes the rule of law, remains effective. The framework unites the states under a clear concept and thereby put pressure on China or other states that try to change the status quo. After Russia invaded Ukraine, the regional states, including Japan, were concerned that China would take a similar path to Russia to achieve the unification of Taiwan. Yet the deepening defense cooperation among like-minded states that share the principle of FOIP would raise a hurdle for China to take bold action. In addition, test support from developing states such as ASEAN and the Pacific Island states also strengthens the legitimacy of the FOIP. So Asia is a dynamic region with full potential for economic growth. China is the center of such dynamics. Given China's position as an economic leader in the region, the best scenario is find an, finding a way to peacefully coexist with China. Mm -hmm. So there is no simple prescription for that, but I suggest three steps. One, to articulate and argue for FOIP. Second, to get wider support from not only the like-minded states, but also the global South. Third, more importantly, to provide incentives for China to comply with international law. So by creating a win-win situation, we will achieve peace and stability in the region. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kyoko. That was a really fantastic framing of the issues. And it was fantastic to have you reflect on how FOIP was in response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, because I had somewhat forgotten that history, that it was connected to China's Belt and Road. And it's funny because we already see China's Belt and Road uh, being remodeled and redeveloped into the Global Development Initiative. And it made me think, maybe FOIP needs some sort of facelift or some sort of reimagining to reinvigorate it, just like China has re reinvigorated its Belt and Road. Uh, thank you also for providing this sort of three-step framework. That's very helpful for us to go into questions. And, and before I pass to Professor Cavalza, just to reflect on the fact that uh, you mentioned the Quad and AUKUS, and Michael also mentioned AUKUS. Surely Chester is going to mention the Squad. So without further ado, can I please pass over uh, to Professor Cabalza, uh, Chester, for your introductory comments. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandra. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to the organizers for this webinar for giving a voice to a Filipino commentator like me. I also would like to greet all the Filipino participants today in this uh, important event. I heard today that uh, many Filipinos uh, who signed up uh, for this uh, event um, are the most number of attendees uh, in our webinar today. And of course, uh, we're showing our great interest on Japan's efforts to widen the scope of the free and open Indo-Pacific or FOIP. But what is the relevance of, point of FOIP to the Philippines? Well, uh, geographically speaking, the Philippines is at the center of the Indo-Pacific region, which is deemed as one of the most important uh, regions today in world politics. Uh, strategically, uh, the Philippines is a uh, gaining traction after Manila inked an important um, defense pact with Tokyo uh, through the reciprocal access agreement after Washington and Canberra's uh, distant forces agreements with Manila. Soon the Philippines will gain mutual cooperation or security cooperation with, uh, of the same caliber with Canada, New Zealand, France, um, the United Kingdom, and Indonesia. But how did the Philippines forge a robust uh, economic and uh, security ties with Japan and ending with a high note of giving premium to FOIA? Since the enactment of the Japan-Philippines Economic Partnership Agreement, um, which is uh, called uh, the JPEPA in uh, 2006 in Helsinki, uh, Finland, uh, which was signed by former President uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo and then Prime Minister uh, Jun uh, Junichiro Koizumi, he worked hard to foster economic security of the two democratic countries in the region. JPEPA is a comprehensive bilateral um, trade and investment, uh, the first uh, bilateral free trade agreement for the Philippines after 50 years since the Second World War. And since then, 
Japan has become a true and reliable friend of the Philippines by massively investing on our infrastructure programs in different administrations of Philippine contemporary presidents through the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA. In July 2024, Japan and the Philippines have vitalized a groundbreaking security pact called the Reciprocal uh, uh, Access Agreement, or REA, to establish procedures for cooperative actions in fostering jointness and interoperability to manage hegemonic competition in the region. It gives life to the overseas security assistance, which is a clever and reliable source of defense and Coast Guard upgrade and modernization that the Philippines need right now. In fact, JICA is helping uh, the Philippine Coast Guard through the Philippines uh, Department of Transportation. And also this month, the Philippines and Japan witnessed the 2 plus 2 foreign and defense ministerial meeting in Manila. This is the first time in our history uh, seeing these two strategic partners and friends sharing common values and fundamental principles in maintaining and strengthening free and open international rules based on the recent saga between the Chinese Coast Guard and Philippine Navy in the June 7 uh, confrontations in the second tonne shoal of the West Philippine Sea should be acted and concurred using the adherence of international law, the purity of the white ships of the Coast Guard, and the peaceful resolution on disputes. As a prime advocate and champion of the rules based order, the Philippines and Japan elevate human civility, lawfulness with the With this development, Manila sees Tokyo as a credible resident power in the Indo-Pacific region that can counter China in the context of free and open Indo-Pacific. While it is true that Washington remains to be the traditional ally of Manila, we Filipinos are also watching the pivotal events in the ongoing U.S. elections. The attempt of the Trump's assassination, the stepping down of President Biden, and the possible return of former President Trump, which will possibly impact the contours and tides of Indo-Pacific. But as long as we remain consistent in our words and actions and practice customary laws that would become a strong foundation of international law, particularly the UNCLOS, we will prevail and goodness shall lead us to a prosperity of the port. To relate with the Philippine experience, I'd like to quote President Marcos Jr.'s powerful speech in yesterday's uh, third State of the Nation address to the Filipino people and to the world. To quote, the Philippines cannot yield. The Philippines cannot waver. The West Philippine Sea is not a figment, a figment of our imagination. It is ours, and it will remain ours as long as the spirit of the Philippines to burn bright. The free and open Indo-Pacific, conceived by former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe as a political and social construct, is an expansive maritime trade routes and a military stronghold for Japan and its allies to counterbalance China to, to de-escalate the tension in Senkaku Islands and to the West Philippine Sea as a critical enabler for deterrence in the region. As a gatekeeper of Hoi, the strategic interests of these countries are substantial to the political thinking and operational design to link and connect principled like-minded maritime nations. Hence, the spirit of FOIP is to champion rules-based order that is non-negotiable and formidable to stand still amid indignation of a unilateral force to impose dominion of a single naval power. Thank you very much, Chester. I appreciate that. And actually, I was reflecting in terms of your comments, how differently countries perceive their priorities within FOIP, because obviously, from a Filipino perspective, you are thinking about things in the maritime domain, which is why you talk so much about the Philippine Coast Guard, because that is where FOIP is being tested so much is in territorial conflicts around the Philippines. Uh, and also that your comment about whether when, as long as we can all play by the rules, we will have a, a prosperous region. Well, that is just the point, isn't it? That not all countries are playing by the rules and we're trying to create some sort of structure in a region where there is no equivalent of a security guarantee like NATO, for instance. So we see all of these different frameworks popping up, whether it's FOIP, AUKUS, the Quad, or what I mentioned before, the Squad, um, which for anybody who hasn't heard of the Squad, it is a new phenomenon this year uh, where the Philippines, the United States, Japan and Australia, um, replacing India, uh, are working together in the maritime security domain. So, look, 
This is a time now for questions from me to the panellists and I invite uh, everyone watching to please submit your questions so that I can look through those and make sure that they get asked. But let me start with a question which I'm actually going to throw to the whole panel because I know that everyone watching, it's very difficult sometimes to engage with something that is virtual. And what people watching would love to see is a genuine discussion between the four of us um, rather than just question response. And so for that reason, I wanted to ask all of the panellists, but starting with Kyoko, how are we seeing FOIP actually in action? Is there any tangible event situation where we can say that is FOIP, the concept in action uh, in a tangible way? And can I also just get a, a sense from all the panellists, because I this didn't come out strongly enough in your comments, is how enduring is FOIP? Is it still useful? Does it need to be revamped in some way? Because it seems as though the region is under pressure and FOIP isn't enough. So um, Kyoko helpfully gave a structure. Um, so maybe Kyoko, I'll let you off the hook with that. But for Michael and Chester, what does FOIP need uh, to strengthen it? So can I start with Kyoko? How are we seeing FOIP actually in action? Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, the FOIP is a grand framework, as you mentioned, that emphasized the rule of law. And there was no such framework in the past. So by articulating the principles that the countries had harbored, but never articulated, so FOIP became a framework for cooperation among states to uphold and strengthen the rule of law. And so it gave a chance to for the regional states to face the future of the regional order. So the result was, for example, uh, ASEAN's ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific uh, region, AOIP, and India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiatives, and America's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, and even European powers, you see, such as France and the UK, announced their Indo-Pacific strategies. So, and also miniature cooperation emerged, uh, promoted by FOIP. So as a guiding principle, FOIP provided a chance to state, to think and face the future of the regional order. So that is the, you know, substantial result of FOIP. Mm. Thank you. Michael. Well, yeah, I, I, um, I think I have a slightly different view um, on, on FOIP, which is, yeah, you know, to me, it's it's an aspiration. It's not really uh, a framework um, because it 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 doesn't exist in any uh, you know in any structured way uh, that has really created uh, something that, for example, you know, replaces let's say the U.S. alliances. I mean, it's a good aspiration. Don't get me wrong, and it, and it's and as I indicated, I think it's been a U.S. aspiration for a long time. You know, I think for the U.S. there are two FOIPs. Uh, I really don't like using that that uh, phrase FOIP, but um, I think there's two <laughs> there's two free and open Indo-Pacific concepts. Um, one is, and that's and, and and we have two. Speaking as an American, obviously because we're in a qualitatively different position from everyone else in the region and a geographically different position from everyone else, right? Ironically, right? We're, we're not actually in the region, despite what, what you know, uh, some of our leaders say we're an Indo-Pacific power, fine, but, you know, we're not in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but we are by far the most powerful player in the Indo-Pacific, let's say, obviously, next to, next to China. Um, and so there's two, I think, free and indo free and open Indo-Pacifics for the United States. One is the one that we, for lack of a better word, impose and follow, meaning our, our alliance structures, our ability to move where we want, when we want to bring uh, a, a level of power to it, whether that's military power or uh, economic power that really none of our other partners really can. And then there is the free and open Indo-Pacific that we're talking about today, where, of course, the United States, I, I believe, in Washington has been supportive, uh, uh, values the idea, and indeed looks for ways um, to work with, with partners. But there's really, 
you know, one of the questions that we got, at least in in um, preparation for this, and actually, I think um, Haley, you you mentioned it earlier, was uh, the question of how uh, if the United States is is in a competitive dynamic and relationship, which I think it is with China, and is undertaking certain actions potentially to restrict what we would consider what we would consider freedom and openness in the Indo Pacific. Uh, then how does that fit with with the larger uh, the larger concept? And so that's where it breaks down in and and reverts to uh, national interests. Now those national interests of the United States, I think, are you know interests that we share with 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 many of our allies. But the structure cannot be, in many ways, I think a a, um, a, a an entirely regional structure, um, because as Kyoko pointed out, uh, the free and open concept came about because of China's attempts to close that that down. And so it's an it's inherently a question of uh, unfortunately, but at this point, I think it's inherently a question of what you might want to call blocks in the region. And so that freedom and openness is a freedom and openness of the values and the processes that we think give the greatest opportunity for nations to participate. Uh, and, and I believe the record shows more or less that 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 is correct. But the United States is then balancing multiple free and open Indo-Pacifics at the same time. Hmm. Chester, would you like to add here? Well, uh, just like uh, uh, like what I said earlier, it's a political and social construct. Uh, it can be constructed. It's a work in progress. Uh, at the same time, it can be deconstructed and reconstructed depending on the national interests of those uh, member countries that think uh, the FOIP would be um, important to their um, interest. But nonetheless, if we try to look at it, uh, looking at the Philippine uh, perspective, we've been fighting for um, the law here as part of our freedom of navigation and, of course, because of our um, reason, uh, experience with China. And nonetheless, uh, we've also seeing uh, big powers in the Indo-Pacific, like say, for example, uh, we are a champion of the UNCLOS uh, award. And at the same time, you have the United States that is not a signatory to the UNCLOS that is also supporting the Philippines. And you have China, which is a signatory of UNCLOS that does not respect the UNCLOS. So you see the contradictory of this. So how do we construct now the free and open Indo-Pacific if many of the countries within this uh, region are also trying to buy for their own uh, interest. Maybe because of the hegemonic uh, rivalry that we are seeing right now, it could be possible because of the multiple multipolarity of the world and the existence of uh, different uh, structures like uh, unilateral and uh, multilateral um, um, organizations. The Philippines is recently part of the squad, but uh, it's more of a strategic military perspective. What about the economics? Mm -hmm. And these are something that we have to look at. Imagine that uh, in the future, many of the countries in the region are the most powerful and if not the most prosperous nations in the world. That's the reason why we are seeing this as the future of the world. However, if we don't protect it as uh, it is being conceived and perceived, then um, the question there is uh, what's next for the FOIP? It is just about uh, the, the rules-based order or about the freedom of navigation that we are talking about where many countries contradict each other and you have uh, champions of the UNCLOS that does not respect or does not implement it properly. So those are the questions that we're looking so far. Mm. Yes, I mean, um, it's funny when countries sign up to things, but then they don't actually follow through. I mean, Australia has a comprehensive strategic partnership with China um, on paper, but we aren't close strategic partners in reality. And just so my personal reflections on, on FOIP, I really appreciated Michael's comment about it being aspirational. And Chester, you said it's political and social. If I think about FOIP actually in action, what we're talking about is that there's a concept, as Michael said, but then there's also how are you seeing it play out in reality? And for me personally, I think of any time that there was a, a multilateral system that worked effectively in the region, that's an example of FOIP in practice. So, for example, uh, when Australia took China to the World Trade Organization over China's um, tariffs and um, uh, unethical and illegal trade practices against Australia, Australia was bringing a case particularly against Australian barley at the WTO and 
through the WTO process, Australia was able to get barley back on um, the trade with, with China. And so I see that as a, a multilateral system working to create the outcome which creates greater freedom and openness in the region. So that's just my thinking from an Australian perspective. But look, um, we've, we've talked a fair bit, not just about FOIP, but also about other regional security frameworks like AUKUS, QUAD, SQUAD. Um, can I go back to Kyoko and say, um, as part of FOIP and how Japan imagines FOIP, it also sees these other groupings as forming part of that regional architecture to bring security. From Japan's perspective, how are frameworks like the Quad, for instance, um, how are they fitting into the region? And is Japan seeing any trends away from working in a Quad framework? Because we have other groupings uh, like like the Squad, um, but you know we also have the prospect of a, a Trump presidency uh, that could be putting pressure on these regional groupings. So, Kyoko, from your perspective. How does the Quad and other groupings fit into this free and open Indo-Pacific concept? Uh, actually, um, even Quad and the other security miniature groupings share the ground principle. And the most important thing for all states is to maintain peace and stability. So that means the guiding principle uh, is the same as FOIP. So it does not clash uh, with each other. And the FOIP, FOIP is a kind of yes, concept or a framework, whatever you call, it is not an actual alliance. So that means a uh, quote and other miniature groupings may be able to, uh, you know, supplement a role, uh, which was not, which is not played by FOIP. So that means FOIP and the quote and the other groupings supplement with each other. So this is my view. I mean, you even see new prospects, even though Japan isn't part of AUKUS. Uh, earlier this year, oh. Australia announced that it's considering bringing Japan into mm -hmm. AUKUS Pillar 2, which is the advanced technology and capabilities. So we can see that even, even many lateral groups can, um, can ebb and flow or expand and contract as they need to. Uh, yeah. Look, Michael, should I turn over to you and, and ask a question that I alluded to in my introduction, which was, this inherent contradiction in the United States about a free and open region on the one hand, and also the US's movement towards trade protectionism, more industrial policy, the Chips and Science Act and some tech um, de-risking or decoupling from China. My personal perspective is I'm seeing uh, on the security side of things, uh, you know, the Secretary of Defence talking about free and open Indo-Pacific very strongly, but perhaps a, a trade and commerce are not really using free and open language because they're trying to put restrictions on trade. Um, from your perspective, is the US's move towards industrial policy and semiconductor controls, is that counter FOIP? Well, I, I don't think the US is moving towards industrial policy, and, and that's a very, uh, it's a very contentious issue uh, in the United States. And um, it's certainly not anything I think that's that's been agreed upon. And I think Rather, what you have is a security driven, um, it, well, you know, in the case of chips in particular, right, because it's so important, it's critical. Um, it's a it's a security driven uh, policy that affects economics, but it, it, it's not designed to reduce, you know, economic interaction. It's designed to protect, uh, you know, core national interests and, and ultimately, I would argue, interests of our you know, of our partners as well. I mean, look, the Trump administration, uh, one of the very first moves was to pull the U.S. out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And uh, then, you know, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton also said that she was going to do the same thing. And so, you know, the U.S., because of these domestic concerns and domestic issues, was walking back from, uh, you know, a very long-standing commitment to, uh broad-based free trade agreements. On the other hand, what the Trump administration did do was at least begin to pursue and went you know, fairly far down the road with Japan with looking back to bilateral, uh, smaller, but what they would argue were higher quality uh, trade agreements and, and you know, agreements on services uh, and the like. So I, I, don't, 
I don't see what the U.S. is doing uh, is, um, first of all, not industrial policy. And I, I think what it is doing is doing in a way that, look, if if you if what you're arguing is that um, we need a more robust and a healthier uh, regional and, and by extension global economic environment, then actually the decoupling from China is a way to achieve that because the the environment that's actually grown up over the last 30 years under China is very unbalanced, right? You have countries like Vietnam, countries like Malaysia and and, and I think even you know Indonesia um, that want to move up the value added chain. They want to they want to be able to uh, get more, uh, uh, you know, more specialization within their economies and have the opportunities to become uh, service and logistics centers, but simply haven't been able to because of the overwhelming dominance of China uh, economically. It's actually been an unbalanced system. And so I think that when you look at the decoupling, if the decoupling means not just, which which I don't think is possible, reshoring to the U.S. because our economies change too much, but opportunities for other countries to take on some of those, um, you know, to stop manufacturing textiles and begin manufacturing electronic components, that is actually going to be a much healthier uh, economic system and, and quite frankly, a, a more open one. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing, though, that, that, that struck me, Haley, about what you said um, with WTO, which was simply to, to um, mention then that, that your example um, showed that the free and open concept is actually dependent on extra regional institutions, right? Uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned WTO, very important and very good, um, but that means that there really is nothing within the Indo-Pacific today that that can replace those global institutions. So, in some ways, a free and open Indo-Pacific depends on the health of a free and open global institutional network. And that's where, again, the role of China in um, increasing its influence in international organizations, suborning those international or organizations, bringing into those international organizations purely Chinese national goals, as they did in the WT, uh, the, um, the World Health Organization, or they've tried to do in the uh, International Civil Aviation or, uh, Association, right, uh, organization, that then had probably has a more significant deleterious effect on a free and open Indo-Pacific than anything in the free and open Indo-Pacific that may or may not work, right? So it's still linked to a much larger global uh, network in a, in a global free and open uh, world. Um, and that's also what we have to be focusing on. We can't just separate out the Indo-Pacific and say, well, we're going to come up with a whole bunch of of different sort of sub-level uh, agreements and expect them to work in the absence of a working international system. Hmm. Yes, definitely. We need a lot of different frameworks to help us bring some order and they're all playing a different role, I believe. So the World Trade Organization is playing its part, you know, and they're only as strong as their individual members and how each country is able to hold these organizations to account. So I think we're all trying to um, get along and use these frameworks as best we can. Um, I mean, we talked about the Quad. It's obvious that the Quad has been, it's been sort of languishing this year because it failed to have a leaders summit in India and hopefully we'll see one before the end of the year to keep that momentum going. But it also raises this question for me about, it, we don't just need FOIP, we need other practical groupings that are doing things and creating um, deterrence like Chester talked about. And actually, this is where I'll bring Chester in, but also start to go to some audience questions. So one of the questions that says it's from many participants, many countries, meaning that there's a broad interest in having this answered. Um, so for Chester, um, the question's about how FOIP's an inclusive vision that emphasises the rule of law but how do we deal with neighbouring powers that disregard UN decisions on territory and flout international law? I mean, obviously, this is one of the toughest questions. How do we all come together to have it, make international law have teeth? Oh, well, um, you know, in the Philippines, of course, uh, one of the reasons why we are determined uh, for a collective deterrence, because, of course, uh, we are a middle power and uh, there are other major powers surrounding us. 
And at the same time, because of the different instruments and how you resolve this uh, issue um, peacefully, uh, there are other mechanisms on how to uh, do it. Of course, by harmonizing uh, the different uh, multilateral and multilateral uh, um, um, subgroupings that you mentioned earlier. But at the same time, it's beyond that. Uh, we have already a framework, which is the FOIP, and we are building a structure on how to fortify and strengthen this, um, this, this concept, this aspiration, this framework, basically. Because ultimately, if we lo lose it, and another um, idea will come up, and then uh, trying to, uh, uh, in a way, um, disfigure this kind of um, organizational structure that we have right now, then definitely it would be a different world that we are seeing. Uh, what are the, the recommendations that we are uh, offering so far? One is, of course, to uh, allow many like-minded countries to create uh, different multilateral, multilateral groupings uh, so that uh, we can create a, a coalition of, um, of, 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 of countries that are willing to uh, support us in these um, uh, ID, uh, this kind of uh, idea. Remember that, of course, uh, it's an anarchic uh, world out there. We've been experiencing a lot of uh, grazing tactics, and uh, China so far right now is a big, uh, is 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 really big in terms of its military economy and its influence in the region. And uh, of course, uh, the the more important here is the deterrence. Uh, even if uh, we have expounded on the the, uh, the the foundations of these principles on maintaining a free in the Pacific. If we don't have jointness and interoperability in terms of our commitment to support each other, then um, it brings us to the question of uh, how are we going to sustain it? Because ultimately, of course, it's not only a military or strategic issue here, but uh, it goes beyond that. We're looking at the economics and, of course, the uh, fluidity uh, of, of people uh, from, from moving from one another country uh, within the bounds of the Indo-Pacific. And um, lastly, I think um, the importance of um, uh, unity among these uh, countries that are willing to, to, to support us. Because of course, right now, there are other challengers. Like uh, say, for example, um, this is not only about uh, uh, the region of the Indo-Pacific, but you have other uh, challenge regions around the world. What is happening right now in the Middle East, in the Baltic mm -hmm. uh, region. I think these are major problems of the world. And FOIP is just one of the regions which we are seeing as um, uh, a neutral ground for us to experiment on uh, certain issues such as uh, lawfare, economics, and uh, definitely security. Chester, I want to pick up on something you said and actually push you a bit further because mm. the Philippines is at the cold face of this challenge. I mean, you see China's Navy and Coast Guard using really extreme and violent tactics against the Philippines over the second Thomas Shoal, which is in your exclusive economic zone. Uh, you see them using water cannons and causing real destruction to the Philippines. I'm wondering, a question for you, but I would really love Kyoko and Michael to, to come in on this as well, is um, one of the questions we've had is, okay, how is FOIP uh, including what Kyoko mentioned, the Global South, but also ASEAN countries, um, because, Chester, you mentioned that you need to have countries working together, otherwise there's not going to be a collective response. So how is the Philippines talking to other Southeast Asian countries mm. to get them on board with this free and open Indo-Pacific concept? Um, is the Philippines having any traction with ASEAN about FOIP? Okay. Uh, right now in ASEAN, uh, of course, we have the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which is a uh, very uh, promising in terms of its uh, connectivity, um, economic and trade um, aspects. But uh, when it comes to uh, security and strategic um, value of it, given that of course uh, we are very, um, how would I say it, uh, diplomatically um, um, resistant uh, to, to, to China's uh, <laughs> um, in intervention, aggression, and also hostility to the West Philippine Sea, uh, at least we're trying our very best uh, on how to resolve it on our own. Recently, China has um, initiated talks uh, initiated talks with uh, Manila on the bilateral uh, consultative mechanism on how to um, de-escalate the tension. However, if you try to look at the re reality in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN basically, it is uh, polarized and divided. Not all of the uh, member countries in ASEAN are subscribing to the uh, formula that uh, the Philippines is offering uh, to resolve this issue because they want quiet diplomacy because of uh, hedging, 
and uh, of course um, economic support coming from China. But at the same time, we are looking uh, some other um, issues like, uh, see, for example, uh, ASEAN is at the center of this Indo-Pacific um, um, region. But at the same time, not all members of ASEAN are supporting us in our advocacy for rules-based norms. Um, like, uh, say, for example, uh, one of the issues uh, when it comes to the arbitral award in 2016 would, would be its enforceability, which even up to now, for eight years, we've been fighting for law fair, and um, not all members of the ASEAN are supporting us when it comes to that because it is divided in terms of uh, the value of uh, its uh, maritime security in the region. Secondly, uh, you have, uh, that's the reason why we are expanding and widening our diplomatic cloud and at the same time, our uh, defense agreements with like-minded uh, nations. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, aside from the U.S. and Australia, um, uh, Canada, uh, New Zealand, France, the United uh, Kingdom, Indonesia are planning also to forge defense agreements with us because this is the only way for us to deter China and at the same time to uh, think of jointness and collective um, uh, deterrence uh, for our interoperability in terms of of how to counter China because, of course, uh, China has ambitions. Let's accept that reality. And at the same time, they're trying to counter the FOIP. And uh, they perhaps may not believe to this idea because they have a di different plan. Uh, that's the reason why we are trying to uh, uh, create uh, such norm and at the same time uh, to uh, increase these um, this 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 knowledge and uh, idea to for for us to have more uh, unified narrative when it comes to uh, propagating this idea in maintaining peace and order in the region. Mm. Kyoko and Michael, I I want to invite you to come in on this. I mean, the question we've received from the audience is: Is Foyt being diluted uh, by being too inclusive of the global South and ASEAN? And this is also a question the Quad faces. You know, the Quad respects ASEAN centrality, but how how much do you dilute something and then it becomes less effective? So, Kyoko and Michael, what are your thoughts about is the free and open Indo-Pacific concept appealing to the global south? Yes, of course, because you know, if it focuses on strategic aspect too much and then also focus on the competition with China, other countries, um, including ASEAN and the Pacific Island states, might want to take a distance from FOIP. Um, so the FOIP needs to expand the area of cooperation by including climate change. For example, you may say climate change is indifferent and irrelevant to security issues. Yes, of course, it's irrelevant. But for the Pacific Island states, climate change and global warming is a serious threat for them. So to attract their, to get their support, we need to also deal with climate change and other you know, issues such as economic prosperity. And by having them on our side, we may be able to put pressure on China. Otherwise, China also you know, provide alternatives to global South like BRI. And also China is trying to expand its groups like expanding by Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So um, it's a kind of, so FOIP actually emphasized the uh, you know, rules and the norms and the freedom, democracy and the human rights. But we have to note that not all the states respect democracy and human rights and we have a different view and we have to accommodate different views. So rather than like, you know, emphasizing the values, liberal values, we better focus on practical issues like economic prosperity, the rule of law and the climate change. And by doing so, we may be able to attract more, you know, support from the international society. So just think about, you know, uh, the global South response at the time of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So they did not uh, support or participate in the economic sanctions. So they actually try to take a distance from our response, you know, the West country's response and our economic sanctions on Russia. So to avoid that situation, we maybe we should expand the you know, scope of POIP and also expand the scope of cooperation and try to weaken the competitive and the strategic aspect. But however, at the same, uh, on the ground, at the basis, there is, of course, a strategic aspect, and we want to 
con not contain, but we want to stop China to change the status quo. Mm. Thank you. Ma Michael. Uh, well, I, 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 I'm not a, I don't really know what the global South means, quite honestly. Um, there's, mm. there's so many different countries with different interests and, and different groupings and different sub regions. <laughs> I don't see that, that it's a particularly useful concept. I understand it's very mm. popular. But I don't, I don't think it's very useful to be totally, to be totally frank. Sorry, it's a little late here in Washington. So, um, but uh, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, maybe what we need to do is take a, you know, take a page from from Beijing and understand that what these nations need, whether they're Pacific Island nations, whether they're ASEAN nations, whether they're landlocked Asian nations, um, is quite honestly very transactional. Um, they have certain desires and needs. Uh, for example, the U.S. has traditionally been very or at infrastructure aid. It's just not something we, I've never understood why we don't do it, but we really don't do it. Japan does it much better than the United States does. Um, but that's what, what many of these countries want. And it's one reason that China has been, been so successful. Now we don't like the way that China goes about it, right? It doesn't, it doesn't adhere to environmental standards. It doesn't adhere to labor standards. It doesn't adhere to, to, to free um, sort of free trade standards in the sense that they, they, they take the, um, uh, the, the contracts and they give it to to Chinese companies. I mean, the 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 host nations, so to speak, get very little, very little out of it, other than you know a, a road that soon cracks or a building that that's not really habitable after a while. Which goes back to the whole question of just how successful Belt and Road really has been, and and how much of it has just been, uh, you know, a vehicle for Chinese intrusion into these areas and attempts to gain influence, but but really hasn't garnered a ton. Yeah, I mean the, the the debate we have today is so much more um is so less concerned about Belt and Road than it was 10 years ago when we were all panicked about it. And I think that's partly because we've seen the limitations. So uh again, you know, uh I you know, I don't mean to be to be negative, but you know, when we talk about cooperation, we really have to think about a, what these nations want, and it's not always cooperation, it's they want certain things, and whether we provide it or they or someone else provides it, that's the bottom line. But number two, also what, what that means beyond, you know, we, we talk about cooperation, um, few nations, I mean, there's a scale, of course, but few nations can contribute that much. The, you know, the, these are nations just struggling to to survive in many ways, and we should be helping them as much as we can. We got, we saw a lot of that in um, in the Pacific Islands in the in the past couple of years with China coming in and essentially, you know, leasing entire islands because it was giving them something that they needed. Very um, poor countries that are trying to develop. So when we talk about cooperation, I think you know, I just think we need to be a lot more. Um, realistic, maybe. Um, hmm. I'm not saying we're not. You know, I'm not saying that they're not good ideas, but I think we have to be just much more aware of 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 really what it means to be operating with such vast power disparity between the United States and Vanuatu. And you know, what really are you able to do together? It doesn't mean you shouldn't help and you shouldn't try. And I would love to see more of that. And I think uh, the Biden administration has had people out there visiting regularly, and that's that's a that's a that's a big step forward. But it's a big difference from saying that we're somehow creating, you know, enduring and durable and really effective cooperation measures uh, on a host of issues that I'm not sure we have all of the capacity to do it, quite honestly. It's a shame to say it, but, you know, this is a my country stretched fairly thin right now mm. with Ukraine, uh, with the conflict in the Middle East. Um, obviously, with just maintaining uh, the commitments that it has in Asia, I think we have to be. I think we have to be careful only because we don't want to wind up so disappointed that reality and expectations are mismatched that we then um, get frustrated and 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 in fact it becomes a negative loop as opposed to uh, I'll use a baseball metaphor um, for all of our friends. I hope you're familiar with the American game of baseball, uh, a, a wonderful sport. 
and everyone gets excited about home runs. I'm not sure what it is in cricket. Centuries, maybe. I've never understood it. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's an amazing game. I wish I understood it. Anyway, everybody's interested in home runs, but really successful baseball teams are built on singles, meaning you get one base and you build on that. And maybe you get two bases and you build on that. And that's that's what I think we have to do. Um, and sometimes you get very bold moves like AUKUS, which I've um, been a fan of and and was writing quite some time ago about bringing Japan in and making it jockus because I think Japan absolutely can contribute to pillar two and it should be contributing to pillar two. And it's a natural fit given Japanese interests. Um, and I would very much like to see whoever becomes president next January, bring Japan uh, more closely into that process. Um, and that's really bold. And, and because it's bold, it has risks. There's a lot of risks with Pillar one and the subs uh, going to Australia. And so um, while we need those, we also need the smaller hits, the smaller successes that show that we understand, that we're committed, and that we can make progress without attempting to transform everything. And that's why I said, you know, to me, free and Indo -Indo, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific is an aspiration. It's not a it's not a policy. It's not a plan. It's not a structure. But it's a really good aspiration. The point is, how do you get there without getting disappointed and frustrated and saying, ah, you know, on to the next aspiration? Mm. Now, Michael, I think you're right. Everybody does need a good dose of reality, and it's been a very, very hard couple of weeks for all our American friends. And the point you raised too about, you know, would would countries in Southeast Asia or the Pacific Islands who are developing countries that just need to keep the lights on or need roads or need infrastructure, do they care about a free and open concept? And I would agree with you. The answer is probably no. But to Kyoko's point about how we can provide countries with choices um, in terms of what Japan is doing with infrastructure I think developing nations would understand that if they're given more choices in who they partner with, where they get development assistance and infrastructure and do other long-term economic partnerships. You know, that is an example, I believe, of free and open Indo-Pacific. Indo Look, um, we are quickly running out of time and there are a few different questions. I do see the word jorkus in here. But I'm, I'm going to avoid talking more about AUKUS, mainly because the only AUKUS partners currently on this chat are Michael and myself. <laughs> so instead, I'm actually going to ask a, a really difficult question that's come up that I love. And I love difficult questions because often I don't get asked them. And I really want the tough questions. So I'm, I'm going to ask my all three panellists this question. The question is, is the Indo-Pacific being effectively divided between two competing camps? Can FOIT function in such an environment? environment. And I think this goes to the point that was raised earlier, which is that there are blocks forming in the region. And whether you consider that the Quad and AUKUS um, and trilaterals between the US, Japan, Korea, um, and many other trilaterals are part of these sort of competing blocks. Um, that, you know, if we say that they're all part of the, the FOIP framework, then is it creating actually more division and not creating the unifying principle that we want? So can I go first to Chester, um, then Kyoko, and perhaps, Michael, I'll give you the last word and let you get off to sleep after that. Well, for me, it's a matter of uh, perception on how we see it, if it's a binary world of uh, two competing powers. But uh, at the same time, it's a springboard of a new idea uh, because of the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, it allows us to imagine more on the future of the world. And of course, it's about um, connectivity, uh, shared cultural and political values, and rule of law. And at the same time, it talks about uh, the future infrastructure of the world, on how we unite together and um, uh, seek for uh, choices on how we deal with this uh, economic mess that we are uh, experiencing right now, despite the... Um, alarming consequences of uh, major wars that are happening around the world. But at the same time, it also gives us um, a prerogative on what kind of, um, uh, of, of, of region we want to uh, construct based on the rules of law and given the realities that many of the nations uh, around this region are uh, maritime, archipelagic, 
then uh, let's also consider uh, climate change and other all the ordeals that the world is uh, experiencing right now from uh, the economy imbalances and at the same time um uh, to to foster to to elevate the developing economies small nations on how uh, they would uh, forge a cooperation and at the same time although we are seeing uh, an arms race basically in the region because of this uh, competing uh, hegemonic rivalry right now uh, but at the same time we also see um the um the upgrade and military modernization of uh, countries that uh, wanted to protect their sovereignty and sovereignty rights at the same time and uh, most importantly is that uh, there we are forming uh, perhaps uh, a new perspective on how uh, to create coalition uh, because uh, right now in the region we are experiencing a great dilemma on how to um, look at great power that should not be acting like that but at the same time it gives us an overview that even if uh, there is a prejudice aggression hostility violence uh, that are being uh, felt and experienced right now in the region uh, we see a um, more um, optimistic views on how to cooperate and at the same time uh, how to value uh, friendship and trust among each other. Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. So uh, as Marco said, hope is not an established framework. It's a kind of guiding principle. So that means China can join hope if China wants to. <laughs> So we are open to China. So the door is always open. And so I don't think FOIP is divided in the region because uh, as I said, China can join if China wants to. And also FOIP is just providing alternatives to China's BRI or China's economic assistance. And also China provides an idea of the importance of complying with the international law. So weaker states like Global South or whatever we call, weaker states love to maybe um, love international law because they have not power to change the status quo or they have not power to you know get through their ideas or reflect their national interest in the international society so you know uh, the world that respects the international law is better for weaker states so in this point of view FOIP is not just um Hope is a kind of better idea for weaker states to follow. So I don't think FOIP is dividing the region as long as we respect or uh, comply with international law, we could achieve peace and stability. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Kyoko. Okay, Michael, you have the last word before I wrap up. Yeah, just, I mean, it's, it's a great, question it's hard no way to answer in just a minute I, I get it's ironic right that that it it could be interpreted as creating division and blocks but you know we had that during the cold war as well because ultimately what we're talking about are competing visions uh of order competing political visions uh in the region obviously ASEAN itself has has a great variety of uh political systems within it and so um, the ideological component uh, can be deployed um, both by the, the parties trying to create something um, uh, such as a, a, an aspirational free and open Indo-Pacific or those trying to defend against it because what they what they believe is that it is um, it is something that uh, is actually um, designed uh, to to constrict them. And so I, I just, I just don't know if we can really, you know, even, um, I'm not even sure we need to be worried about that. Uh, you know, if what we're saying is that uh, whatever structures or policies that we are trying to adopt or create for a free and open Indo-Pacific um, are derived from our values and support our interests, then we should pursue it. And, and uh, we hope then that whether it's Beijing or anyone else sees the values uh, in that. But uh, again, I think that it gets back to the concrete. What are you what are you really trying to achieve at what point in what space in time? 
and uh beyond that you're you're really you can get a little too ethereal about all of this and 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 be dealing with abstractions as opposed to solving the problems that hopefully will allow you to maintain the peace and stability that we all value in the region. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much. That's a really lovely note to end on. And we are well and truly out of time. So I'm not going to at all attempt to uh, to do a sort of stock take of everything that's been discussed. I'll just say the main point that came through to me through this whole discussion about free and open Indo-Pacific and all the various groupings within that is that we are really at um, a tension and a contradiction between inclusion and dilution, meaning these frameworks are trying to be inclusive, but uh, if we add new members, whether that's the Quad or Jorcus, um, if we try and include everyone to capture more um, agreement and um, a larger cohort, it does risk diluting those groups so that they're ineffective. And that is an inherent tension that I think we're going to continue to have to grapple with uh, for many years into the future because we're all trying to get along together and have this prosperous and stable region, uh, but it's a matter of, of how we do that and recognising the rules-based order as the FOIP concept would really want us to do. So, look, can I really thank our panel members, um, Michael, Michael Chester and Kyoko. Uh, for Michael, it's a very late night, and Chester and Kyoko, we're really in a good time zone together. But can I also um, ask the audience's help? We like to make these webinars as engaging and as useful as possible, but we can only do that with your help. If you're watching, um, can you please scroll down to find the link for our satisfaction survey? We welcome both positive and constructive feedback to help improve our webinar. Um, lastly, I really want to thank the sponsors of this webinar, Nikai and the Government of Japan. Uh, without their support, these types of discussions uh, across oceans wouldn't be happening. And also, if you liked this webinar, it's good news because there are more to come. The next one is on semiconductor policy development and competition. I will definitely be tuning into that um, no matter what time of day it is because semiconductors are the new area of competition and only a few countries hold the very uh, rare components for semiconductors. Um, so please keep an eye out for that event and thank you very much to everyone for joining us.